welcome everybody and thank you very much to Dominique again for inviting us and for organizing this. This is really a, a, a now an incredible conference. Um, so let me start. In the weeks following the German attack on the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, local inhabitants in hundreds of cities and villages attacked their Jewish neighbors and fellow citizens. They beat them, tormented them, raped them, stole their possessions, and frequently murdered them in the most brutal manner. This intercommunal violence occurred in a brief spurt, but a six-week period, um, but stretched over a very broad territory of tremendous ethnic and religious diversity. The pogroms that occurred in Lithuania, the pogroms occurred in Lithuania, the former eastern Polish borderlands, eastern Galicia, Volhynia, Bukovina, and parts of Romania. So let me make just a few very brief comments on them. First, these events did not happen everywhere. They occurred only in the territories that had been occupied by the Soviet Union after September 1939. In the areas of eastern Galicia and Volhynia, on which we've collected data, only 126 of more than 1,600 towns and villages where Jews lived do we find these sorts of pogroms occurring. Our basic question is why? What makes these sorts of places unusual? Why did these, um, these sort of relatively rare events occur in these places and not elsewhere? To answer this question, we first had to find out where the pogroms occurred. And for that, we drew on the work of others, and there's already been prodigious work done on this question, including by John Paul Himka, Kai Struva, many others. Um, and we combined it with our own supplementary archival work, especially using the documents at the, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, the 7,200 testimonies that are, are deposited there, many of which are on the eastern borderlands, Yad Vashem, um, the, the Holocaust Museum, and a few other places. We looked at the political backstory of all of these thousands of places where pogroms did and did not occur to see if we could find differences. Jason's going to talk about some of our findings and explain our, our main account. But I thought it important to address a few important explanations that our research design precludes from being true or being completely true. First, the German presence. Clearly, this was a necessary but insufficient condition. No Germans, no pogroms. The, but the Germans were everywhere. And sometimes the pogroms happened before the Germans arrived. Of course, they happened in the German presence. And sometimes pogroms happened after the Germans left, pushing on eastward. They undoubtedly wanted these pogroms to occur. And they filmed them, took pictures of them. Um, John Paul Himka has, has given us some of those pictures. Second. Let me go to move point two, the Soviets and their purported Jewish support for the Soviets during 39 through 41. Especially important in these kinds of accounts are the NKVD prisons discovered by the, um, the Germans when they arrived and then shown to the local populations. We do address this in the book, but it's important to note that the map of NKVD, NKVD prisons does not match the pogrom map very well. They may have made matters worse. Indeed, I have no doubt they made matters much, much worse. But the Soviets were everywhere. If the, if the presence of the Germans and then the Soviets was enough to, sorry, the Soviets and then the Germans was enough to cause a pogrom, we should have seen many more pogroms than actually occurred. Now, let me move to a third factor, the own. In some ways, blaming the own, it, 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 Look, I mean, it's, there's, it's undoubtedly true that the ON was mo a mostly anti-Semitic organization. And um, most accounts of these pogroms stress the, the, the presence and the participation of the ON. But I think it's also important to note that the ON was pretty thin on the ground in the first weeks of the war. And placing blame on the ON al alone does not re really, what it really ends up doing, and this is, I think, in some ways more important, it ends up taking the Norod off the hook by drawing our attention away from the social and political backstory of the kinds of places where pogroms occurred and where they did not. So let me turn the floor over to Jason, and he'll talk about what we actually found. OK, so. Um, 
So here are our geocoded. So there's about 200, let's say 200, I don't remember the exact number, 219 uh, pogroms that we found. And I want to, is there a point? Is this thing a pointer? Okay. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, these, this is the area of the eastern borderlands that we study. There were no data for actually the Lithuanian uh, areas and beyond. And so actually the, the book is structured into different chapters. There, so, so this is where the Poles were, the ethnic Poles were the primary perpetrators in Białystok and Polesia. And uh, there's a, a, another chapter that deals with the three Galician voivodeships. Uh, so, so this was all Poland at the time, so we're using the Polish names, I should say, in this uh, context. There's, there's no political statement. Uh, it, this is simply a decision for purposes of the book to use the Polish uh, labels for things uh, in the three Gal Galician voivodeships. So basically, the things I'm going to talk about right now are the Galician voivodeships and uh, separately uh, Volhynia, uh, which were the Ukrainian areas uh, uh, of the country. So a um, couple of things before I go to the next sl slide. And so in addition to the NKVD prisons and other things, there are sort of two master explanations for why pogroms occurred. One is that you get represented by Jan Gross and many other people that are basically about anti-Semitism uh, and involving, in his case, the Poles, but it's been made uh, for uh, also, you know, in the Lithuanian areas and the, and the Ukrainian areas. And so that's one. Uh, Thing. We think that that uh, you know, contributes, um, but there's something else going on in addition to anti-Semitism. And the main argument against the sort of simple version of the anti-Semitism hypothesis is there weren't enough pogroms to justify that explanation. So if, if you think that anti-Semitism was widespread, you would predict 90% of the places having pogroms as opposed to roughly 10% of the places. Ask, me, ask us more about that later, more, much more can be said. So that's one argument. The second argument is that uh, it's not really about uh, uh, Jews at all, but about communism. And so, uh, you know, the Polish term, you know, Zido Komuna so, sort of, uh, you know, it's really about, uh, it's the Jews as communists, and this gets to the NKVD part. Um, uh, that's the second kind of master explanation. And um, so it's not just about NKVD prisons. Uh, uh, because those were relatively few in comparison to the number of uh, comparison to the number of pogroms, and so we tried to deal with that argument using other data. Now I will get to the data. Lacking time. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we take all the places, uh, uh, you know, all the. So this is a municipality and actually village level analysis. So it's a very small level of a, you know, it's well below the level of the Poviat. So this is basically. A Poviat is a, is a county, so there were two, 300. Uh, uh, there were 272 Poviats in interwar Poland, so this is below that level. It's called the Gmina. Yeah, so this is like the community, uh, community level. So it's a very disaggregated data. What, what do we do? So we have all of these data. Uh, we, some of them have pogroms, 126 of them have pogroms. Uh, nearly 1,700 do not have pogroms. So we create two subsamples. One, uh, 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 one where the pogroms occurred and one where they didn't occur. And then what we did was we collected various uh, uh, demographic and political data. So let me talk about that. So, oops, sorry. So these come from the 1921 Polish census. And when, uh, so, so actually, you know, how do we measure, how did the poll, uh, how do we measure this? The, the Polish state actually collected ethnicity and nationality data for reasons of uh, the historiography, uh, everyone agrees that the religious data was more uh, accurate than the nationality data. So basically, when we say Polish, we, we are measuring it with Roman, uh, the percentage of Roman Catholics. And this is the, uh, 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 it's harder. For Galicia, it's fine to use Greek Catholicism as a measure for Ukraine. For Volhynia, it's, it's a problem because some of the Ukrainians were Orthodox and, of course, the number of Jews. This is the census data, and then we have we have data from the 1928 elections in Poland. And so, uh, 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 so, so this is a vote for the you know, Zionist Jewish party, the Orthodox Jewish party, the communist, and the or the government party of Poland at the time. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna zip into, you know, what do we, what's the takeaway from these data? And maybe it's actually uh, better if I stand. 
uh, get out of uh, people's way. Uh, the, the, uh, the first thing you see here is that where pogroms occurred, there were, uh, so there isn't a big difference in between the number of poles, but it's where uh, the Ukrainians were a minor, you know, on average, if you will. So the median Ukrainian number was uh, actually uh, close to being a majority, but a minority. Uh, as opposed to the place where the Ukrainians were uh, absolutely overwhelmingly dominant in the non-pogrom area. So that's the first thing to note about this, because our argument is going to be about the threat, uh, is about the threat, uh, the perceived threat of Jews uh, to Ukrainian national aspirations. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, good. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, by the way, if it were an anti if there were, if it were an anti-Semitism hypothesis, for example, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't think that the number of Jews would matter for whether there was a pogrom or not. I mean, if it's about anti-Semitism, it's like, well, uh, we want to get rid of we want to get rid of the Jews. It doesn't matter if it's a small number or a large number. You would commit a pogrom to do it. Uh, we think that this is indicative of something else going on. So that's, if you will, uh, the, uh, a demographic. Uh, the, demographic side. By the way, this is for Galicia only. This is not Bohemia. The second part of the uh, argument concerns, you know, what, what, what were the political conditions of the municipalities, you know, the, you know, the, the communes in which pogroms ultimately took place. And, uh, you know, what we find is that, uh, you know, there's no, no di so this is the party of Hasidic Jews, the Orthodox Jewish party, Agudat. We find that there's no, uh, you know, uh, there's no difference in the probability of a pogrom depending on whether a, a commune uh, supported. Uh, so this is a proxy, if you will, for the presence of Hasidic Jews, who were the vo the voters of the uh, Agudat party, and we see a, a small uh, relationship between the Bebevere and maybe the biggest one or the most striking one was the places where pogroms occurred were more Zionist than other places. And so our argument, and it actually comes, it's more, it's more clear uh, actually due to data availability uh, in the Polish. Uh, so we're not presenting the Polish data here, but there's a chapter on Poland. It's easier, if you will, to make the argument for because of data availability. But basically what we argue is that the, uh, the more robust explanation for pogroms uh, uh, is not the, uh, if you will, the anti-Semitism argument, because uh, you know, anti if you think that anti-Semitism was widespread, you would predict more. So, so we don't think that that's, it's there, but, but, but more needs to be said. So, so it's not the only thing going on. It's also not, if you, if you proxy uh, you know, Jewish support for communism by the proportion of the vote given to communist parties, uh, you know, in uh, these areas, we don't see an effect at the mass level. Uh, so, so there's no effect, uh, if you will, of the degree to which a commune gave support for the communists as an indicator of kind of uh, sympathy with the Soviet project. There's no effect. So we don't uh, find very much on the, com uh, on the Jews as communist argument. What we do find is that, uh, so how we interpret this is, Essentially, that uh, the, these were these were municipalities where Jewish nat what we call what we refer to as Jewish nationalism uh, or Zionism was strong, and just a footnote on what that means in this context. So Zionism is about you know uh, emigration to Israel. That's one component of it, but uh, in, in this historical context, Zionism had another meaning, which is realizing uh, Jewish national rights within the countries that they resided. That was the, if you will, the other and arguably more important component at the time, a pre-Holocaust uh, time. The Jews as national equals to Poles and Ukrainians within interwar Poland. And it was this uh, quest for national equality uh, that we think provoked, uh, the, uh, this posed a threat to both Polish right-wing ultras uh, represented by uh, Domofsky, who wanted, uh, you know, uh, a, a Polish Poland, and also to uh, you know right-wing uh, elements in the Ukrainian context that also wanted a nationally homogeneous uh, Ukra uh, Ukrainian state, so so without minorities. 
without Jews who, who insisted on group rights, and as we all know later on, without Poles. And so, so uh, one thing to emphasize is our entire analysis is between the outbreak of Operation Barbarossa in, in uh, you know, June 6th and basically the next two months. What is it? June 22nd. Yeah, June 22nd, sorry. And then till August 3rd. So okay, so, so June 22nd until the beginning of August. So before the, before the ghettos start to form and before the Germans come back and start uh, organizing uh, what would become a different kind of uh, violence against Jews. And so in this period, the Germans are pushing towards Moscow and are not yet uh, organizing things on the ground. And so this is the period in which, if you will, civilians... Uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you know non-Jewish civilians have the uh, best opportunity, if you will, uh, to if they were if if they had a propensity to commit violence against Jews, this was the best opportunity they had to do it.